and yeah, the different sort of directions today. Uh, this morning we've got quite a range of different presentations uh, talking about a whole bunch of uh, different things. So rather than try and set up as a, as a combined thing, we'll look at as individual uh, presentations. First up, uh, this morning we have a uh, dual presentation uh, from Jim Terrell, who's the Chief Revenue Officer at Philadelphia Airport, and Tim Richardson, who's the CEO of Enlightened. Uh, they're going to talk about customised pouring arrangements um, in airports um, and uh, the experience directly at, um, at Philadelphia, and I suspect also as well. By way of introduction, Jim is responsible for all the business and real estate related activities um, at the airport, including the purchase and sale and lease and use of, of, of all the airport properties. He also does airport uh, air, uh, air service development um, and FMB, and must be very busy because he's also doing rental cars. I imagine parking is your original trade, right? That's uh, pretty much the way it works. He joined the Department of Fusion Aviation in 1987. Uh, he's a lifelong resident of Philadelphia, so we're passionate about his airport. Tim uh, is an expert in negotiating and managing best in class pouring rights, uh, previously in, or currently indeed, in Stadia, uh, and other man used hospital systems and the like, and more recently in airports. Uh, they will tell you the story of, uh, of the business they put together. Tim, Jim, welcome to the stage. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Um, first, I want to say thank you. Uh, you've done a great job organizing this track and um, uh, uh, moderating these panels. I've learned a lot this week. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all and talk about pouring rights at airports. Um, and thanks for coming this morning. So, let me see if I can figure this technology out. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to stay within the time limit here. Um, so, pouring rights agreements. Um, uh, many of you probably don't know what they are. They're not very common in airports at this stage, so I'm gonna have a really basic description of pouring rights and we can get into more detail in the Q&A if you want. Um, Coke and Pepsi and Nestle and other global uh, beverage companies really want direct relationships with airports. Um, it's, it's their for fundamental business model to partner with premier properties. Uh, around the world, and so they want to partner with you. Um, the, oftentimes when we start talking to airport executives about the kinds of uh, revenue that can be generated, uh, they're skeptical that, that that kind of money can really be uh, generated. Um, there's a lot of margin in sugar water, and there's a lot of margin in, in this water, and so there is um, money to be had. Um, uh, beverage sales always increase when you do a pouring rights agreement, which is sort of counterintuitive. People, people think the opposite. People mm -hmm. think if you go exclusive, um, you know, you might be limiting choice in some way. In fact, you're expanding choice, and in fact, in fact uh, beverage sales usually go up. Um, uh, and we all, I've heard many times at, at conferences like this over the last three years that the airports are focused on improving the passenger journey, um, the, the traveler journey, um, and you want to you, you uh, one of the ways you can do that is partner with, with uh, one of the big beverage companies. They know a lot about um, anticipating and meeting consumer needs and expectations and creating really exciting um, brand experiences for your, your travelers on your campus. So what are the key benefits of pouring rights? Um, uh, you know, first and foremost, we touched on grow non-aeronautical revenue uh, without any new capital expenditure, no, no capital cost or new operational expenses. Um, it's rare that you can find opportunities like that. Um, and one of our clients told us that, that he's going to generate more revenue with, with this pouring rights agreement than anything else he could possibly do and, um, in his concessions program. You will improve the traveler's journey. Um, like I said, uh, Coke, Pepsi, Nestle, all the major beverage companies around the world, they have existing partnerships with other premier properties, with celebrities, with sports leagues, sports teams. Um, they are eager to, to leverage all those other assets and those other investments they've made with you at your place of business. Um, so you can have some really exciting kind of synergies there that you can take advantage of. Um, uh, access to business insights and other resources. Um, again, these beverage companies are consumer product giants. They, they spend a lot of time, energy, and money researching what consumers need and want. They're ahead of it. They're setting trends. They're ahead of they're, they're establishing trends and consumer behavior. Um, they know a lot about your customers and, and you can leverage their insights and their knowledge and, and match it up with your own um, and really maybe better anticipate what consumers need and want when they're on your, on your, uh, your term, in your terminals. Um, increased beverage sales and other benefits for the tenants. Um, uh, 
well, pricing will go down um, for your, your operators, your tenants, um, especially the smaller local regional operators, um, the ACDBE mm -hmm. tenants. Um, you think about it, many of you are trying to have, uh, bring more local flavors, more local operators onto your campuses or your, your terminals. Um, those people don't have the clout or the, or, the, or the business savvy or the volume to negotiate great pricing, great rebates, great, great merchandising support. You do. Um, and so uh, you, can, you can ensure that all of your tenants get the lowest possible prices on their, their cost of goods when it comes to beverages. Um, uh, the, the larger, the larger uh, global players, the, the hosts, the Hudsons of the world, of course, they have their own deals with Coke and Pepsi, and they have great pricing already. Um, and so what we'll do with them is we will uh, at least match their current prices. Um, that's part of the RP process. Uh, I encourage anybody who's exploring a pouring rights agreement to, to make sure that in your RFP, you, you tell the beverage companies that pricing needs to stay the same or go down for all the parties. Um, there are other social benefits of having a pouring rights agreement. Um, uh, you know, um, Coke and Pepsi are global leaders in sustainability uh, and recycling. Um, that's a common theme I hear among a bunch, bunch of airport executives. Um, everybody's thinking about those things. You can partner with Coke and Pepsi and Nestle, the other big beverage companies, and um, leverage what they're doing and, and bring it to your campus. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, some people are concerned about the health uh, impacts of full sugar soft drinks. Um, so, is, so are the big beverage companies. Um, that's why all of their growth is in healthier for you products, waters, juices, teas. Um, if you said to your beverage partners, hey, we want to de-emphasize full sugar soft drinks, we want to emphasize healthier products, they will be right there with you. Uh, that's, that's, that's what's growing in their portfolio, and they would want to do that with you. Uh, let's see. So uh, pouring rights, like I said, are best practice uh, in every other sector around the world. Um, so any hotel you go to, this convention center obviously has to do with Coke. If you walk downstairs, you see the Coke vending machines, you see all Coke, CSD, or carbonated soft drink, and all the, all the tenants downstairs. Um, so um, uh, every facility like this, every, every casino, every theme park, um, like I said, has a deal. Um, and uh, there, there are a lot of reasons why airports are sort of late to the, late to the party, um, but there's no reason why it can't happen in a, on a greater scale in airports. So just some concrete examples um, of what other airports around the world have done. These are really, these are US airports. Um, I'm, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. We're based in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, so we know more about the, the US market. Um, Dallas was the pioneer in these deals. Dallas started all this in, in airports in 1995. They, um, they did a deal with Pepsi, um, a 10-year deal in 95, very successful. They re-upped with Pepsi. They did a comp competitive RP, but they chose Pepsi again in, in 2005, another 10-year term, and then they just switched in 2016 to Coke. Um, so literally, in a, in, a, in a span of several days, all the Pepsi coolers and Pepsi product was gone, and and, and Coke product and Coke coolers and the fountain equipment was installed. Um, and and, and, and the people also sort of are sometimes concerned about just the operational challenges of, of, of switching or going exclusive. Again, Coke and Pepsi and Nestle and these big companies, they do this all the time and they're, they're very practiced at it. So the, the operational challenges you might imagine that come with it are really not that, that big. So anyway, so Dallas did it. They have about three and a half million a year in direct funding. There are a lot of other benefits. I'm not talking about the sort of the soft benefits here. Um, this is all sort of cash um, uh, benefit. But, you know, so Coke does stuff like um, built out children's areas. And they, when the Olympics were going on in Brazil, they flew their athletes, some U.S. national team athletes through the Dallas airport and did special meet and greets with U.S. athletes at the airport. So things like that are not included in that number. That, that's uh, that's um, a cash number. Um, Philadelphia International Upper Jim Trail is a great client. We've been working with Jim for about three years now. Uh, and um, they, Jim, Jim chose Pepsi. We're agnostic. Uh, when, we, when we work with clients, we're agnostic. We don't, and you, and you, should, you shouldn't go into it with any preconceived notions about, hey, we're in a certain market. We have to partner with this beverage company or that beverage company. It really should be about the total package and the total program being offered. But Jim chose Pepsi. Um, about two million a year on average. This first, the first year, really, we're st still implementing the first year. It's a lot more than that because there's some initial um, one-time conversion fees paid. 
Um, but uh, uh, it's a good deal for Jim. Uh, the Detroit did it uh, after Dallas um, in 2009. They did Pepsi first, now they switched to Coke. Um, and Indianapolis, uh, a smaller airport with a smaller value deal. Uh, they've been with Coke since uh, 2011. So how do these work? Uh, so, so if you have a pouring rights agreement, you, uh, you have a, a direct contract between your, your airport, your entity, and the beverage companies. And I say one or more beverage companies. Uh, we're learning in the EU and around the world uh, as we work, we're probably going to have to do, um, or the airport is going to have to do probably two or three pouring rights agreements, uh, break them out by categories. So um, from the EU, we think in, in a lot of markets it's going to be you have a, um, a water RFP and a water partner. Uh, water is obviously huge, uh, sparkling water, still water, all different kinds of water. Uh, and there are major water companies in the EU that, that want to aggressively compete for your business. Um, there would be a, a juice RFP probably, and then there will be uh, everything else, which is carbonated soft drinks, teas, energy drinks, things like that. Um, so you'll have a direct relationship with the beverage company. Um, uh, the typical pouring rights agreement, um, the, as I said, the, the beverage companies provide funding, they provide pricing, uh, price uh, increase caps every year on your tenants so, that, so they can't gouge your tenants. Um, and I want to make this point now that um, uh, sometimes I forget to make this point. Some people think that um, because all the tenants and concessionaires have their own relationships that we're just sort of shifting money away from uh, tenants and concessionaires to the airport. That's not the case. The, the, the pie gets bigger, the, the funding, so the tenants are made, kept whole and the, the funding pie gets bigger when you have a direct relationship. And there are a lot of reasons for that, that we can go into. Um, the, the, a pouring rights agreement typically covers um, uh, all non-alcoholic beverages and non-brewed beverages. So uh, we are always at, uh, at our firm, we're always asked to do a beer deal or a whiskey deal. We don't do those deals. You can do those deals. You can find help to do those deals or you can do them on your own. Um, but we, we, pouring rights agreements really are focused on non-alcoholic. And non-brewed means, so, so no coffee, no hot coffee, no hot tea, and also no dairy. Um, those are separate kind of categories of beverages that are specialized uh, and, and usually aren't a part of pouring rights agreements. Um, the, the winning beverage company, you know, we, we, if, you, if, you, if you go down this path, you should have a public RFP process, of course. If you, we encourage a lot of transparency, of course, um, just, like, just like you would procure any other, any other um, partner. Um, and and, the, and I'll, some, sometimes people are concerned about the, 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 the beverage companies are going to want to sort of uh, overwhelm and overtake the campus and put logos everywhere. Um, I just want to emphasize that you're in control. It's your property. You control how much marketing happens, how much branding happens, um, and that's the that's collaborative decision that's made between the airport and the beverage companies. So um, a lot of people feel like, they, we get this question all the time, like, well, wait a minute, you know, Co McDonald's is on our campus or Burger King's on our campus, and we know they have their own deal. People know that all the restaurants have their own deals, and so, and they say, well, we can't, uh, we can't tell McDonald's what to serve. Uh, we don't want to get into their business and we don't want to tell them what to serve. Well, in fact, uh, I should say we, we have a restaurant practice. We work for global restaurant companies uh, around the world, uh, Burger King, Popeyes, a bunch of um, uh, Tim Hortons. Um, and so um, all the beverage companies and all the concessionaires have or should have in their contract with the beverage company what's called a, a host property exception rule which simply means if, you, if, if you're working at a premier property, a university, a convention center, an airport, and that premier property has its own pouring rights agreement, then, then you're free to serve whatever that host property wants you to sell or wants you to serve. Um, and so it's really not, so the concrete example here, this is the Detroit airport, um, see if I can work this, this, uh, this, this McDonald's at the Detroit airport. And um, uh, when Detroit did the deal with Pepsi, uh, the McDonald's uh, franchise, he said, well, we, we're partnered with Coke, and, and the airport said, well, you're on my property, and I just did a, did a deal with Pepsi, so you need to serve Pepsi. And so they switched, um, and they served Pepsi. Um, uh, and it's interesting, uh, that McDonald's is the, at the Detroit airport is the highest grossing McDonald's in the whole state of Michigan. And so they didn't want to leave. <laughs> they wanted to stay, and they're happy to serve Pepsi. Um, uh, so, to, so this is another point I want to make. Uh, we're all drinking less and less carbonated soft drinks. 
um, uh, we're all drinking more, more water, more juice, more tea, um, and, and you know, soda are, typically represents only about 15 to 20 percent of the volume going through any, any airport. Um, so, and it's declining every year. So when we think about the beverage wars, or you know, it's not the cola wars anymore, it's the beverage wars. Um, both Coke and Pepsi have huge product portfolios. And again, the growth for them is in healthier for you products. Um, so, um, uh, so that's an important point to make. Um, uh, oh, this, this last point on the, the bold statement at the bottom, uh, another sort of counterintuitive thing about beverage deals or pouring rights agreements. Um, uh, actually, choice expands greatly when you have a pouring rights agreement. And, and so let me kind of unpack that a little bit. So right now, any airport, mostly you go to any airport, I've got, you know, I take pictures now of all these coolers at airports, and, uh, and you look at them, and most of them are, have uh, one or two rows of carbonated soft drinks and energy drinks, things like that, and then about six rows of water. Um, and um, and there lim there's really limited choice right now in terms of categories of product. When you do a pouring rights agreement with a beverage company, they very much want to put all their, well not, but a lot of their product portfolio on, the, on those shelves. They want the traveling public to see, hey, we have kombucha, we have a green tea, we have, um, you know, fill in the blank, whatever sort of exciting, new, innovative uh, product that's, that, that's uh, taken over the beverage industry. They want that on the, on the shelf. They have that product, they want it on the shelf. Um, and so sometimes operators, especially smaller tenants, aren't thinking about exactly what the consumer wants and needs. And, our, and, and so you have a buyer for a small mom and pop shop, and they're not thinking, they're, they're probably thinking, I don't like kombucha, so I'm not gonna put kombucha on my shelf. No one's gonna buy that. When in fact, your traveling public wants kombucha. So, so, so just kind of a counterintuitive point, but something we hear all the time, and I wanted to emphasize that. Um, so, um, uh, this is just some summaries of what the, the Dallas has earned over 50 million since they started doing it in 95, Detroit has earned, earned over 11 million. These deals are getting richer, um, so on a per passenger basis, we're seeing the more recent pouring rights agreements that we've done and other people have done um, are richer on a per passenger basis. So, um, the beverage companies value your property more than they ever have in the past, and, and so it is a good time to, to think about this. Um, so again, I, I mentioned earlier, uh, it's not just about the money, it's about creating engaging airport spaces. So um, Pepsi, uh, has, uh, Lipton, is a, Lipton is a Pepsi brand. Uh, anything you see in a bottle or a can um, uh, by Lipton is typically distributed by Pepsi around the world. Um, and so when, when you partner with Pepsi, they might wanna do uh, sort of a, an immersive experience at your airport where they will show you how they source all the tea where the tea comes from, uh, let you taste different flavors and brands of tea, uh, styles of tea. Um, so those kind of like, you know, experiential opportunities are available when you partner with a beverage company. Um, let's see, we talked about some of these other points. Um, I think we've covered these other points already. Um, okay. Um, like I said, the, uh, if you're on the fence about whether or not you should do this, um, you, should, um, you, should, uh, you should know that the beverage companies want to do it right now. This last bullet I want to emphasize here, if you don't want to do a beverage, a pouring rights agreement, if you think it's not right for your, your, your facility, that's fine. But I think you should, at a minimum, include in your, 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 any new lease you do, any new contract you do, any new RFP you issue, you should, you should insert language that says you, have, you, you specifically reserve the right to do it. Um, that way, five years down the road, uh, when I, I think more and more airports are gonna start doing this, five years down the road when you are ready to do it, um, there will be no question, every tenant, every concessionaire uh, will know that that has always been in your, in your thinking and a possibility for you to execute on. Um, and that's it. So I'm going to uh, stop there. I'm going to introduce Jim Terrell. Jim's a, a, the Chief Revenue Officer at Philadelphia and Jim has some practical experience with all this. Jim, take it away. Thank you, Tim. Sure. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks for coming here so early um, on a, let's see, today is a Thursday morning, right? Awesome. So my name is Jim Tyrell. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at Philadelphia International Airport. And 
Um, my focus is going to be tell you why Philadelphia chose to do an exclusive pouring rights deal. And it, it really wasn't an easy decision for us, but for if, if you folks are um, working at airports right now, you know that the number one um, priority for airports is generating non-airline revenue because that's what makes the airlines want to serve your airport. Um, so we were presented with the opportunity um, to consider a pouring rights agreement back at the end of 2016. <clears throat> and one of the first things we did when we were evaluating that decision is to begin putting um, pouring rights language in all of our concession leases. Um, at Philadelphia, the airport has about 180 different concession locations operated by about 100 companies. So as you might well imagine, any given year we will turn over a dozen or so leases um, due to term expiration. So we took the opportunity to begin putting the option for the airport in these subleases um, just about the time at the end of 2016 when we were presented with the opportunity. <clears throat> we went through a, a few months, several months actually, in, in doing our due diligence as an airport to see what the impact of this would be on not only on our revenue, because that's kind of a no-brainer, but on the other um, kind of unintended consequences. At the end of our due diligence, uh, the airport developed three primary goals that we decided if we could achieve those goals, <clears throat> then we would definitely go forward with a pouring rights agreement. And the goals, the goals were um, equally important for us. Not one was more important than the other. And they were uh, increase and diversify the airport's non-airline revenue. The second goal, again, equally as important and has become increasingly important to airports around the world, and that is to enhance our customer experience. People have a choice, um, especially in today's day and age when they're booking travel and you have so much data at your fingertips. You have a choice to fly out of or through any airport you want, especially in Philadelphia's case where, I mean, we're a large hub airport, but we're also, uh, we have a predominant airline. It's American Airlines. And there are three or four different American Airline hubs situated on the East Coast that you could choose to fly over or through anywhere you're going around the world. You can choose Philadelphia, Charlotte, Dallas, Miami, depending on your destination. And a lot of people make choices depending on the airport and the experiences they've had at those airports in the past. Like I can tell you, I hate to fly through Chicago anytime during the months between October and March because typically you'll hit a weather condition. Um, that's not reality, but it's my perception. And as a traveler, I make my travel decisions based on those perceptions. So again, one of the goals we had was to enhance our customer experience because that is critical to the airport. The third and, and certainly not least of our goals was to strengthen the financial position of our tenants, uh, specifically our concession tenants. It is not easy to be a concession operator in Philadelphia. You are faced with labor harmony requirements, paying a living wage, not that those are, are bad things, it's just challenges for small, middle, and even large companies. Um, but also we have street pricing. So in order to generate a profit at the airport, you really have to be a good operator. And, and those, are, those are tough things to operate under. So we basically told our consultant in Liven that we will not enter into a deal that is funded on the backs of our concessionaires. The money that the airport gets related to this agreement would have to be from another source. It would not be from our tenants. And in fact, we were able to um, generate a, a, a huge savings in terms of cost of goods for all of our tenants. And it was important for Philadelphia because we are primarily made up of small and medium-sized tenants. Of the 180 locations, only a handful, we try and, and, and divide it equally between the national retailers and the small local operators. The national retailers are very important to us. And in the US, there are four major retail companies who operate at airports. And we just happen to have all four in our airport. Um, you have Hudson, you have Paradis LaGarde, you have Stellar News, and you have HMS Host. It was important for us to make sure we were not going to alienate and or lose those retail concessionaires who operate at our airport. So the first thing we did when we were considering going to an exclusive pouring rights agreement was to meet with these four companies individually, 
lay out our plans for what we're going to do because we actually pride ourselves on being very transparent with all of our stakeholders. And it was an interesting response we got. One of the companies said, eh, it's probably not going to be a problem. We'll negotiate it with and, and we'll be able to work it out. One of the companies said, it depends on which company you pick as to whether or not we're going to be happy or not. One of the companies was in transition. They were in the process of being acquired. They were also in the process of entering into an agreement with us. And they said, we're not really sure on how we feel about this. One of the companies actually drew, <clears throat> drew a line in the sand and said, if you do this, we will not operate any longer at your airport. Um, so, make a long story short, we went through the process. We were able to achieve our three goals. We did, in, we did enter into an exclusive pouring rights agreement with Pepsi. Um, it just so happens, you'll remember my number two retailer that said, if I pick the right company, it won't be a problem. We picked the wrong company. Um, but anyway, in the end, it turned out not to be a problem. That company was able to negotiate um, an additional agreement with the airport. We did move forward um, with a new deal with that company. So again, um, in closing, the airport achieved all of its goals. We did generate uh, a sufficient uh, non-airline revenue to make this a very positive decision on part. As a matter of fact, we're still in our first year, year of the agreement, and we have generated over $2.5 million, which is well in excess of what we anticipated we would generate in, in revenue, um, as well as an additional allocation of money that is part of the deal that will be used as an enhancement to our customer experience through um, different experiential um, opportunities. Um, for those of you who are Eagles fans and will be coming around Philadelphia on April 15th, you can actually visit with uh, Zach Ertz, who is a tight end of the Philadelphia Eagles, who will be coming to the airport to uh, meet and greet a lot of our passengers as they come through Philadelphia. This is just one typical um, opportunity that Pepsi has presented us. Um, a not real sexy opportunity that Pepsi is helping us out with today also is to address our sustainability issue. Um, Pepsi has come to the airport. They have leveraged their resources because they are a global operator um, and they have opportunities that the airport is not necessarily privileged to uh, participate in. But they are helping us, again, um, achieve our goals in, the ter in terms of sustainability. So while Tim said pouring rights may or may not be right for your airport, I think it's, it's um, long overdue in the airport environment, especially with the pressure on airport operators to generate non-airline revenue and more importantly, diversify those revenue streams. Um, so that's why Philadelphia chose uh, to do a pouring rights agreement. Thank you and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Do you have any questions? Or Jim or Tim. Great question. Um, uh, in America, there's, there's no problem at all doing these deals. Uh, we've learned around the world there are anti-competition -com concerns and questions. Um, we have spent a lot of time and money w w with lawyers in the last uh, year and a half, especially in the EU, trying to sort that out. I think um, um, we have um, you know, been advised that uh, it's, it's not uh, uh, anti-competitive in the EU. We have also spent some time and money in um, in, uh, in in Asia, uh, addressing some of the same concerns, and uh, we've been told in there it's not a concern. Um, but um, um, it's I would say it's something that you need to think long and hard about. You need to kind of understand, and you need to have either your own in-house counsel or your consultant or your outside counsel really look at it and think about it from your market's perspective. I'll give you, in the EU, we're moving forward with some EU business, and um, uh, once we, it's kind of interesting, kind of solved itself. Once, once we realized in the EU that you really probably need to do multiple pouring rights agreements and that water is such a, a, a big category in the EU, once you introduce uh, that concept of doing multiple pouring rights agreements, um, the anti-competition concerns go away. Um, so, uh, but it is a case-by-case -case issue. Any other questions? I was 
listening to the Lewis story, I was thinking, particularly was to ask about the US, um, that there is an increasing number of people concerned about sustainability, carrying our own water, carrying our own tea containers, particularly in North Asia. So water, which is the, the new oil, um, right. is there a threat that the, the fact that water is, is, is in disposable containers um, actually going to be a concern for this is the dirt and water? Yeah, um, it, it's a huge issue. Um, and so I confess, if you look at my briefcase, I've got a little refillable water bottle <laughs> on my briefcase. Uh, uh, and so um, it's a big issue. It's, I think every airport needs to think about it and needs to be a part of your, your planning process in your RFP. I will say that both uh, James Quincy, the, the, the Coke CEO, and the, Ray LaGuardia, the new Pepsi CEO, spoke at Davos this year, and that was the, the that was the that was the, the core focus of their remarks was water conservation and and, um, and and the plastic problem, and how they're what what steps they're taking as companies to address it proactively. So it can, it, it is an issue. It can be part of your uh, I think your pouring and rest agreement can be a part of the solution, not not perpetuating a problem. All right. In the absence of any other questions, um, Jim and team are to to run. Um, so we're going to excuse them from the stage, and while they're uh, they're acting on leaving, can you just? Oh, thank you. <laughs>